uh, West Angeles CDC and the wonderful work that she's doing. You know, as you, as you plan a conference, it's always interesting how when you do things, you just are never sure exactly how it's going to go and who's going to be there and who's going to speak. And, but it's amazing, at every CCDA conference, God always has a way that he makes it happen in just the right way. And uh, one of the things, I was out here in L.A. a few weeks ago, or actually a few months ago, and uh, all of a sudden, one of the people of faith that I have followed all of my life. I actually uh, have cared and, and, and read much of what he's written in various articles and things. Showed up at the planning meeting. And his name is Viv Gregg. And Viv showed up and we had everything planned, all the things tight. There was just no way. But Viv is one of those saints that if, they were, if they're here, we got to at least let them say something. And one of the things Viv is going to do is he's going to do a whole series of workshops, five workshops with some of his uh, special friends involved in things that are going to help us understand planting churches in poor urban communities all over the world. And uh, one of the things that's happening, and Viv is, Viv is from New Zealand. He just spoke at Moody Bible Institute just uh, uh, not long ago, and he made everybody there extremely angry. Now, there's a few that are with him. But he told them, if you're going to be missionaries all over the world, what you've got to do is you've got to, the first thing you've got to do when you show up is you've got to apologize for all the things that have gone wrong in the Western world as we've taken the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, that didn't sit too well to go as an apologist in that particular way. They've taught him how to be apologist in the scriptures, but not how to apologize in the reconciliation kinds of things that uh, Lula was talking about. I first met uh, Viv when I was in the Philippines, and he was there working amongst the squatters in the garbage uh, dumps. But Viv, would you come and just say a few words to take a couple minutes? I want everybody to be exposed to you and uh, your great ministry for the kingdom of God. First, first met John in New Zealand as he stayed on a marae, which is a Maori meeting house, for three days and slept with the people in a process of reconciliation. And John, in my country, we've got good news of the 700 violations of the treaty at the foundation of our country. 143 have now been through a process of reconciliation and restitution. And even uh, one tribe has set up a university for their leadership from the restitution process which is occurring. We're making progress. But Wayne, uh, I said to Wayne, Wayne, I'd like to uh, just take a few minutes and to uh, call, call uh, people from this conference to the slums of Asia and Africa and Latin America. I was ordained in the slums of the Philippines by the people of a small church that had planted, and they sent me to a, a more destitute squatter area. And there I began to preach. The people threw rocks at me, which doesn't happen very often, but this was a rough, immoral, gambling, drunken group of people. After 12 weeks, I was about to give up. And that week, President Marcos sent in the Marines and a bulldozer to bulldoze down this community. The people stood in front of their homes to protect them. The Christians who'd ordained me, they said, they came down. They stood with the people in front of the bulldozers. The Marines are trained to kill. Police are trained to deal with people. Marines are trained to kill. One of the girls began to taunt a Marine. He opened fire. There's still blood on the walls. As the people were loaded into the trucks, the Christians sat with them on top of the trucks. As the people rebuilt their houses outside Manila, the people, the Christians, helped them rebuild. That week, a church was formed among that people yeah. till today. And I want to bring you greetings from these people. I think we need that video. I want to bring you greetings. Uh, and I want to bring you greetings and to call you because they ordained me and they said you're to go around the world and to call other brothers and sisters to come and to live among us. Not to set up programs, but to come and hang out, to come and be among us. And I'd like to call for 10% of you here, a tithe from CCDA every year who would go overseas 
to be among the people overseas. Is that reasonable? <laughs> um, I'd like to bring you greetings from the churches in Manila, from the churches in Calcutta, in the slums of Calcutta, the five churches in the slums, from the favelas of Sao Paulo, where I've lived. Uh, I'd like to ask you to come and work with the Brazilians as they go into Calcutta to train people in soccer, to train street kids in soccer. <laughs> A great thing for Brazilians to do. Come and work with them. Into North India, up the Ganges, there is a woman here. Uh, she will lead teams into the cities up the Ganges. Nagpur, Jaipur, Ahmedabad. Have you heard of these places? Come and walk among the poor in these places. We can talk of other cities, Caracas in, in uh, South America. The Chinese are going to build a thousand new cities in the next 10 years. We need workers to go into the factories of China and to be workers and to speak of Jesus. It's to this that we've been called. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he's anointed us to preach good news to the poor and that's focused on proclamation. It's focused on the poor, not on poverty, but the people. Um, but it's holistic. It's comprehensive and it ends up in bringing justice for the poor. And today we have great unjust situations, the greatest migration in history. The two billion people who've moved from rural areas to cities. These people come to the cities, no place to live, build a shack, form a squatter area. These are the most responsive people in the world today through the gospel. And who else should go but people who've been working among such people here in the U.S.? So here is a simple call to follow Jesus, the incarnate one, to follow this Jesus, as he came and he dwelt among us, so that people day by day can look and to see. See if his glory is on you. See if his grace is in you. See if the word of God, his truth, is flowing from you. And the testimony over these last 20, 25 years, as we've got hundreds now of workers into these cities, is that when men and women dwell among the poor, then the Spirit of God begins to break out. Mm. You don't go with a program. It ends up with significant works. And I can talk of how the evangelists and the apostles are initiating the works. The pastors are building them. The deacons are developing them. I can talk of drug stores throughout Manila where drug, drugs are cheap for the poor. I can talk of programs of a seminary in the slums in another city. I can talk of uh, alcoholics in Bible studies, of prostitutes, of new schools for the poor, of cartoonists developing comics, because poor people don't read, they read comics. God creates all sorts of amazing dynamics among the poor. It begins with someone following Jesus among the poor. And uh, I think there's a call here for folk at CCDA. And it's a very simple call. Leave the comfort of ministry here in the U.S. Follow Jesus because he calls you to go to the ends of the earth. And the style and the patterns and the processes that you've picked up in your fellowship and relationships together, these are what we need in these cities of Asia and Africa and Latin America. Come and walk, not as leaders. Uh, walk. What I said at Moody was just say sorry as you go. <laughs> just come and walk simply saying sorry. And as you say sorry, walk and serve. And God maybe will break out around you. Today we're seeing massive movements of men and women turning to Christ in the cities. You can be part of that. Thank you, Viv. And as you can see, the, the type of ministry that Viv is talking about is exactly what we are committed to in CCDA. Christian community development, as we have been thinking about uh, for all of these years now, is, is a philosophy of ministry that is based upon the Word of God. 
It's important for us to understand that, and this morning we want to talk a little bit more about that. Last, week, last year, um, I gave the eight key components of Christian community development during my time with you, and we have that video available because it's so important for us to understand what Christian community development is. Christian community development is not necessarily what we would say all urban ministry all ministry among the poor it is a philosophy of ministry and one of the key components to it is of course incarnational ministry living among the poor even as Viv was talking about a, a new style of ministry a new style of missionary is not going and living on a missionary compound but living in the squalors and living in the uh, community where the poor live and that's the CCDA style whether it be here in America or it be someplace across an ocean. Now, in my earlier days in Lawndale, people would always come up to me and say, you know, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? If you'd have visited us in Lawndale after I'd been there three, four, five, six years, Ann and I had been ministering there, working together, living among the people as we talk about, and, and, and if you'd come, you would say, well, you know, there's not much going on here. I mean, you got a little, you got a little uh, weight machine and you got a few kids coming out, but, you know, you could really be having a ministry. You know, you could do all kinds of things. You could pastor a large church you could do lots of things and people would always try to get me to leave Lawndale which was kind of uh, difficult for me to understand and then what they would do the kicker would be is that they would get the Bible out and they would get the Bible out and they would turn to John chapter 12 verse 8 and they would say don't you know what the Bible says the Bible says that the poor will be with you always why are you wasting your time among the poor now, I don't know if that experience has been yours or not, but it's been mine on a number of occasions, particularly in my early years. Well, you know, when that happened, I would get a little frustrated. I would, I would, I would get a little upset about it. But then I started getting angry after it happened a dozen or more times. And people who I respected would give me those verses of the Bible. And then I got mad at Jesus. I said, Jesus, you know, I remember praying one day. I said, Jesus, why in the world did you put that in the Bible? You know, why did you say the poor will be with you always? But you know what I was like so many of us here? I was a lazy Christian. Because I had never studied that passage of Scripture before, I had absolutely no idea what it meant. So I decided, well, you know, I'm going to study it. And so I get all my commentary books out, and I start getting everything I'm ready, and I'm going to study this passage. And the first thing I did was I got my Bible, and I looked in the cross-reference section, you know, that little middle section in our Bible. I looked at that, and you know what I found out? There was an Old Testament passage that it referred us back to. So I quickly went back to it, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. Let me read you what it says. It says this, it says, there will always be poor people in the land. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. But then everybody there could finish the verse, just like when I say the Lakers, you know I'm talking about this podunk basketball team out here. Hello. And when I say the Bulls, you know I'm talking about that great basketball team back in the Midwest. But anyway, we could finish this. These were Jewish people. They could finish. In fact, you know the Pharisees had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. They could say it word for word verbatim. But here we see there will always be poor people in the land. Then it says, therefore... Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and the needy in your land. Boy, all of a sudden, I got interested in this. Then I went back and I said, let me read the whole chapter. So I started at the beginning of chapter 15. Listen to what verse 4 says. Verse 4 says this, However, there shall be no poor among you. For the land the Lord your God has given you to possess as you are your inheritance, he will richly bless you. God's plan is there should be no poor among us. It's not something that we should go flippantly say, well, the poor will always be among you. No, the poor are there, and when we find the poor, we are to freely open our hand to them. That's the Old Testament concept that Jesus was talking about. But then it goes on, and it says other things, and it says, verse 5 says, but it's dependent upon something else. There shall be no poor in your land, but then verse 5 says, if, if only you are faithful to fully obey all that I have commanded to you. Do you know why there's poor people in the world today? Because the people of God have not been fully obeying the word of God. I wish I could get an amen on that. 
You see, it is, we, the, God has given us everything. There's plenty of food to feed. We throw food away in America. We can't get food to the right people in other countries. The governments of other countries get in the way. Food is sitting there and people are starving. There is plenty here. There should be no poor in our land. But we must begin to be obedient as we begin to go. But you know what's amazing even there? Jesus even tells us how to do it. The Bible tells us how to do it in the Old Testament concept, in the Old Testament law. It said, okay, now when you help a poor person, don't do it in a way that hurts them. So Deuteronomy, if you just go over to Deuteronomy chapter 24, if you're following me in the Bible, just go over a couple pages, or you can go to Leviticus chapter 19, and it says this. It tells us exactly how to help the poor. It says, now, when you go out, and they lived in an agrarian society, they say, now, when you go out and you're going to uh, 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 harvest your crops, go ahead, get all your crops, but in the... Can you believe it was a law of the Bible that when they went out and got the... and they picked the corn, they were not allowed to pick it up if it dropped to the ground. If the corn dropped to the ground, you couldn't pick it up. If you went by the apple orchard and the apple wasn't ripe, you couldn't pick it, and you could not go back. And the Bible tells us that that was for the widow, the orphan, the alien, and the poor. They left that there. In God's economy, he made a provision for the poor to get their needs met. Now, there's four quick principles I want to give you on that. First of all, whenever you help a poor person, we want to do it in a biblical way. We do it with four, these four principles out of what's known as the gleaning system in the Old Testament. First of all is that we must have an opportunity for the poor to have their needs met. We must look for ways that they can meet their own needs. The second thing is, is there was work involved. Second, second Thessalonians 3.10 says, if you don't work, you don't eat. You see, there's this concept of work, and so the people, I could be a lazy poor person, and I could starve, or I could go out into any field, and I could go pick it and get my food. Then we see the third concept is that as you were doing that, there was some skill building with it. There was some empowering. It wasn't a, a, these meaningless tasks that we give the poor sometimes. Bob Lupton wrote an article oh, oh, a few years ago called, Who is the Truly Needy Poor? It's an interesting thing. Read his book the, uh, on, 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 on the kingdom playground that he's written to give you some of those ideas. But you see, it's skill building. Can you imagine a young, a young teenage boy looking for a job? He goes to the local farmer and says, you know, can I work for you and help you harvest your crops? They said, no, we're looking for somebody for experience. He says, I got experience. You do? Yeah. Where? Last year, I went with my dad in your fields, and I picked the ones that weren't ripe when you went through. I know how to do it, and I know how to pick up the ones that drop to the ground that are, that make sure that we pick them up and we don't bruise them anymore. You see, it's a skill-building talent. When we help the poor, somehow along the way, we look for ways that we can empower them and be, be building skills in their life. And then lastly, we affirm their dignity. When you go home at night, you feel good about a good day's work. When you go home at night, you feel good if you've been able. The most demeaning thing in the world is when you stand in a line to get food. One of the things I tell CCDA groups regularly when I go and speak in your groups, and maybe that's why some of you don't invite me back, but I say, if you've got a free food pantry, close it down. If you've got a soup kitchen that you let anybody come in and eat soup and then you tell them all about Jesus, close it down. That is not Christian community development. That is enabling that poor person to stay poor. That is not the kingdom principles. The kingdom principles is that we look for ways that we get their opportunity. There's a way the skill building, there's work involved, and then we affirm their dignity. When you stand in line and you're a number, there's no dignity. But when you come and you work hard for something, and so at Lawndale, we've worked at this and worked ways to do that. At our medical clinic, if you don't have any money to play, we have a sliding scale fee. If you don't have any money, we got a list of 25 jobs that if you want to. I see Regina Turner out here. She was one of the receptionists when we first started it. And people would go to Regina, and she said, they'd say, I don't have any money. She'd say, well, you could go sweep uh, the gym floor. You could go pick up papers outside. And you know what? The people were thrilled to do it, and they would go do that. Then they would come back and see the doctor, and they had dignity because because they paid something to see our doctor. Giving it away doesn't make it happen. It only enables poor to be more. See, God's way is the way to do it. Same thing at Christmas time. I made the mistake of some of you. Every time, I don't know why it is, every time at Christmas, everybody gets generous and they want to give something. And so people give us all kinds of things and, and come in. And 
a lot of people want to go see things. And so I would, you know, they want to see, I want to go into a poor person's house. I want to bring my kids and see how the other half lives and all of that. And in my early days, I was so stupid. I let these white people from the suburbs come into the African-American community, and then I used my influence to help them knock on the door, and I would say, here, we're bringing you some food for Christmas time and toys for your children. You know what happened every day when I walked in the front door? I would hear the back door slam because Dad was leaving. Oh, some of these statistics are, are so, we, you know, there's a lot of men in these homes that sometimes we don't know about. And we need to help keep those men in the homes. And sooner or later, we need to help them get married to the person they're living with. You know, some of these statistics about the fallacies, yeah, they don't know their daddy or their daddy didn't know, but there's a man in that house very often that if we would work with, we can affirm their dignity and we can help them get married. That's what we do in Lawndale. When we have a wedding with people that have been living together, we just have them walk down the aisle at the end of my sermon and we have a wedding right in their church service. We just did one about a month ago. And we bring two people together because now they are committed to Jesus Christ and now they want to live in the right way. We got to do that. But you see, what I was doing is I was destroying that relationship by bringing white folks in that were giving them all their food, and I stripped those people, particularly dad or the man in the house, of their dignity. So now what we do, and many of you do this, I know many people all over our nation do this, and we've been doing it in CCDA quite regularly, is that what do we do is that we end up taking, and at Christmas time we get all these people that give us toys, and we get them, and then we open up a store. And Mrs. Moore, who's sitting here, and she's our benevolence dresser sitting up here. I like these Lawndale folks in the front row, you know, cheering me, but you've got to say amen once in a while. All right, but anyway, so what, what we, she, she, she gets all the women of our church who know the prices on everything, and if it's something's a dollar, they take it down 10% of the cost. And so if it's a dollar, it's a dime. If it's $10, it's a dollar. And if it's $100, it's $10. And then parents come, moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas, come and buy toys for their children, and they take them back under their tree. They wrap them up, and they put it under, and it's to Aisha from mom from dad, not from some white folk in the suburbs that felt guilty and they had to do something at Christmas time. You see, we affirm the people's dignity and they work for that money even though they might have got a bargain on it. And if they don't have any money, then they get a chance to work in the community and work in the store so they can buy that. CCDA is biblically based. John's Bible studies are so important. As I was listening to John this morning, he was saying many of the same things that I'm talking about. Our philosophy and our strategies come straight from the Bible. The philosophy of incarnation, of what we call relocation, incarnational ministry, comes straight from the Bible. Jesus didn't stay up in heaven and keep saying, how am I going to help these folks? It says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But then what does it say just down in verse 14? This is the Christmas story, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, that's incarnational ministry. And the ministry that Viv is talking about and the ministry of CCDA is that we live among the people. That's the philosophy that comes straight from God's Word. The strategies of affirming and empowering the poor. One of the things that I think we in CCDA have got to do is we've got to out-Bible other Christians. We've got to out-Bible them. We've got to know our Bibles better. We've got to study the Bible more. And you cannot be like I was, a lazy Christian. Churches have gone astray wherever they have been unbiblical. And most of us don't even know. I teach a course at, at a seminary. I won't tell you which one it is. But I teach a course on, uh, uh, it's a part of revival of the church in the 21st century. And I asked a group of pastors in that group one day, I said, what's the central message? These all pastors are working on a doctorate. They already have their master's degree. I said, what's the central teaching of Jesus Christ? We couldn't agree. 50 people in the class, we had 20 answers up on the board. And I said, okay, let's vote for what it is. And we voted. And they all voted. I had them come and put a mark by the ones they thought. The number one answer was salvation. Wrong answer. Seminary trained pastors teaching in America. Wrong answer. I told him, I took him to the Gospels and I said, Jesus talks about salvation seven times. But he talks about the kingdom of God 55 times. Which do you think is the central message of Jesus Christ? It's the kingdom of God. Oh, I was so glad when Lulu was talking and that she says we want to demonstrate what the kingdom of God is about through Los Angeles 
CDC, that's so important for us to understand. The central message of Jesus is the kingdom of God. It's not salvation. When I first was working in Lawndale, I rediscovered the great commandment. You know the great commandment, to love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is just like the first. Key words, just like the first. It's not a second-class commandment. It's just like the first. To love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, Matthew 22 tells us, and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. My son Andrew is a student at Baylor, and I was talking with him the other night, and um, he had gone to a Bible study, and he wanted to tell Dad he went to a Bible study. You know how kids are in college. And he said, Dad, I went to Bible study. And he said, I left, I was mad. I was angry. I ain't never going back to that Bible study. And I said, well, what made you mad? He said, all they talked about at that Bible study was what God was doing for them and how God was doing this. And, do and he said, they were all such piddly little things. He said, Dad, they don't even know the Bible at the Bible study. He said, the Bible is all about loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. I said, Andrew, I'd be mad too, and I don't think I'd go back to that Bible study. You see, the church has gotten this confused, and we in CCDA have got to understand that selfishness is not the gospel. Selfish Christianity is not the gospel. The gospel is loving God and loving our neighbor. At Lawndale, we simply say loving God and loving people. The great commandment. But we also think about, and just stop and think for a little bit. You know some other passages in Scripture if you want to think about what really is God after for our lives, the, if this is the greatest commandment, everything else hangs on it, and that we love God and we love our neighbor. You've, many of you quoted Micah 6, 8. I mean, what does God expect of us? What does God require of us? You could, many of you have memorized it. He requires us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. What is that? Act justly, love mercy? That's loving our neighbor. What is walking humbly with God? That is loving God. Then we go, of course, to James 1, James 1, 27, where the question is asked, what is pure and undefiled religion? What is, what is, what is faultless religion, the NIV says? You want to have a faultless faith? What does it look like? It says, well, what you do is care for the orphans and the widows and keep oneself unstained by the world. Again, caring for the orphans and the widows? Loving people. Keep oneself unstained by the world. Loving God. And actually, what you do if you be bring to bring these down, it seems to me is there's two key concepts in the kingdom of God that we have got to understand. One is loving God, which is righteousness, and the other is loving our neighbor, which is justice. Now, the problem in the American church today is that we've got two camps. And we've got what I call the get saved camp. All they want to do is get you saved, and we call that the loving God camp, the get saved camp. Then over on the other side, we've got another group, and that group is out there doing good works, social things. We call that the social gospel. And you know what we need to understand? Neither of those are correct. They are both wrong unless we bring them together under the great commandment. And when we bring them together under the great commandment of loving God and loving people, of loving righteousness and living a righteous life, and at the same time we are doing justice in our society, then we have the completed gospel. That's the whole gospel. And that's what CCDA is committed to. We are committed to helping people know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, but we are also committed to the justices. What are we going to do about it? The injustices in our society. We need to stop being defensive. We need to stop denying there's a problem. We need to stop disbelieving somebody tell us when somebody plants a gun. We got a young man in our church right now, and I'm getting a little bit angry when I tell you this. Not at you, but at the system. We got a young man in our church right now. Comes to church every Sunday, teaches Sunday school. About two weeks ago, the police stopped him and they planted a gun on him. Oh, I know that some of you right now, your first thought, daggone it, that boy's lying. The police didn't do that. You don't live in my neighborhood. You don't understand what goes on. 
It's an injustice. And we've got to believe those that are around us. We have this Hope House ministry, and you know, I talk to them, and these are men that have gotten saved. These are men who are walking with God. And as I talk with them, I love to hear their stories. And most of them have been to prison. And we're going to do, I'm going to, Jojo and Stanley and I are going to do a little workshop this afternoon about our Hope House ministry with at-risk men. But, jo, but one of the things that I do is I always ask them, like when you went to prison, tell me about your life. And I get their life stories. I love to do that. But you know, write about it, and I keep, a, I keep kind of a mental statistic. About half of the men tell me, Coach, I did all kinds of things wrong. I did this, I did that, I did all kinds of things. I should have been to jail many times. But what I went to jail for, what I went to prison for, I did not do. And I believe them. I believe them. You see, we have got to get involved in these justice issues. And that's what Jesus, Viv had up on the board, what I call Jesus' mission statement. You see, after Jesus is baptized, he goes out in the wilderness, and the Gospel of Luke gives you the story. He goes out in the wilderness, and when he's in the wilderness there, what does he do? But he, he, he prays and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan comes to him and tempts him. And then when he gets done, he goes back home, and the first thing he does on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue. He goes to church. As they knew he was a man of God, some of them had been at his baptism and they'd seen the Holy Spirit descend upon him as a dove. They'd heard the voice of heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So when he came into the synagogue, they immediately handed him the scroll, said, handed him the Bible, said, would you read something? Now, if you go to the book of Luke and chapter 4 and you look there at verse 16, it begins with 16 and 17, it says, then they gave him the scroll, but then it's really, it's really key to see the scroll of Isaiah was handed to him, it says in 17. Then it says, unrolling it, he went to a particular passage of Scripture. He knew what it was to read. And so he goes to Isaiah 61, and then he begins to read. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me and anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He's helped me to proclaim uh, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed. You see, Jesus understood that his mission was not just to die on the cross, but his mission was to set those who have been held captive free and to begin to make a difference in the lives of the hurting people of our society. We got to be more biblical than anybody else around us. You see, the gospel is not just the get saved gospel and it's not just the social gospel doing all these good things, but the gospel is both. In either place, if you go one side or the other, it's an illegitimate gospel and it's not the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. In CCDA, we say in our model that we're going to take the whole gospel to the whole church, to the whole world. That's what we're talking about and the whole gospel involves that. Christmas time. Christmas time. You know what? So many times at Christmas we read scriptures. Let me read you one that we read all the time, Isaiah 9, 6. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we usually stop there. But now we need to read verse 7. And verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, and sometimes we start seven, but we don't read the whole verse. You know, we all do that sometimes. We just stop, because that's all we want to say. But then, listen, it says, He will reign on Dev David's throne and over his kingdom, the kingdom of God, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. You see, the kingdom of God involves justice and righteousness. One of the things that we have in our mission statement and our vision statement at Lawndale is we say all these things of things that we want to do. But then in bold print at the very end, we put that our goal is that every human being that lives in our neighborhood of North Lawndale would be able to have Jesus Christ as their Lord. But then we didn't forget all the other ways that we do that. You know what St. Francis Assisi says, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words some of us our actions are so poor that we will never be heard by what we say we pray in our churches quite regularly our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done we have absolutely no idea what that's about the kingdom of god 
We've got to have an understanding of the kingdom of God. And this, this year at CCDA, we got a whole track on the theology of the kingdom of God. I'm so glad that I've got one of my good brothers. In fact, he's my literal brother. My brother, Vic, who's a professor and as a pastor himself, is going to do a couple of the workshops. He's sitting here by John. He's a little bit better looking than me. He's older than me, but he ain't got no gray hair. I mean, I don't know what happened. But he's going to be teaching a couple, and we've got others teaching in the understanding the kingdom of God and what it is. But we pray that the kingdom of God would come. Tom Skinner, whenever he used to come to Lawndale, and bless his heart, we, he, would, he came to Lawndale and visited us when we were just a little podunk storefront church. 25, 30 people on a Sunday morning. But Tom would always say, and he would always leave with a rallying cry, we got to take Lawndale for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God reigns supreme. The kingdom of God is where God is in charge. The kingdom of God is where God is named, Jesus is named as Lord. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. But we must not continue to be lazy Christians. Where we're poor people of the Bible, we've got to study it. John said in his Bible study that we need to study the Word of God and show ourselves approved. In CCDA, we must get deeper into who we are. We must not just keep being this little easygoing Christianity that we've just got a little three R's that we're going to live with and we're going to do them and all those kinds of things. Man, we've got to be people of the word, people of the Bible. The kingdom of God, you know, when Christ came, he set up the kingdom. He says, the kingdom of God is in your midst. When Christ came, the kingdom was here. And those of you theologians in the group know that now we are in this situation where the kingdom of God is here somewhat, but not totally here. We know it's at the second coming of Christ that the kingdom will totally be here. And so we see what's known as the already, the kingdom is already here, but it's not yet totally here. That's why sometimes when you pray for healing for somebody and God intervenes and God heals, you see the kingdom of God in its fullest sense. But on the same way, with the same prayers with the same fervency you pray for somebody else and God does not heal there we see the kingdom of God is not present is not fully here is not totally here yet it's the way it is and where we go and as Christians we want to live our lives as people of the kingdom of God but we've got to understand what that is we got to understand that the kingdom of God involves righteousness and it involves justice most Christian mission statements, when you read an evangelical Christianity, leave the word justice out. And it's an inadequate mission statement. It's only half of it. It's only loving God. And don't get me wrong, we are to be in love with God. We are to do everything. We're to worship God. We're to live holy lives. And we're to help people to get saved. We're to introduce people to the good news of Jesus Christ. But the good news is even more than that. The good news is that the kingdom of invo God involves justice. It involves peace. And so that's what we're called to do. We got it. We're getting involved in this situation with this young man in our church, and the police made all kinds of stupid little errors in this situation. You know, it's so easy. We have a lawyer, and the lawyer looks and says, oh, my gosh, how could the police say that? You want to you know the audacity of stupidity? They thought they were dealing with some little black boy out in a neighborhood that nobody cared about. But boy, they know something. They're going to find something else out when we get to court. I'm telling you that. You know what they wrote down in the police report? They wrote down that this young man was driving down the road and there's a police car 15 feet in front. And then what they did is this young man with a gun in his car pulls in front of the police officer and turns, makes a left turn in front of him and did not use his turn signal. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're carrying a gun, would you do that? I mean, hello. You know, you're going to drive straight and you're going to look at your... You know. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it wasn't even the way it was. This police officer, two white officers, by the way, totally lied. And we've got to get involved in these issues as members of CCDA. We've got to believe the people in our congregations. You know, so what if somebody does lie to you? I'm going to be on their side no matter what. Sure, we want to look, but we know that God will bring justice. 
And we got to quit being lazy Christians and let the, the evangelical church and Christianity Today and Leadership Magazine and other things, Charisma Magazine, and these other places tell us what Christianity is all about. We've got to quit being lazy Christians and dive into the Bible and start telling the rest of the world what Christianity is all about. We have got to out-Bible other Christians and out-Bible everyone else. Don't be lazy and just think, I want you to study the Bible. I want you to dig deeper into it so that you might understand it. CCDA, if we are going to last, if we are going to have a meaningful ministry in the world beyond John Perkins, we have got to get deeper and more grounded in the Word of God. Because the Word of God tells us how to care for the poor. Not charity where we just give somebody food at a soup kitchen. That doesn't help anybody. We've got to get involved in their lives. And yes, we don't let them starve, but we get involved in ways, as it says in Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 24. Well, you can tell I have a little passion about this. I love God. Man, I love God. And I love my neighborhood. I am such a blessed man. Y'all know, CCJ, I just throw my dirty laundry out here with you all the time. And you know, at the St. Louis conference, I had to stand before you and say that I was unrelocated. And I moved out of the neighborhood for a while. Well, last January, my wife and I in Austin, we moved back into the neighborhood. And those three years were hard. And I learned a lot. But you see... In the course of those three years, I, I had lots of opportunities. People asked me to apply for this job, that job. Now that you've left Lawndale, you know, you could go do this, and I got my doctoral degree and all these things. And most of the things we didn't even need to pray about, but there were a couple that we did, and Ann and I prayed. And we sensed unbelievably this call of God again to go back home. That's what Ann said over and over. She said, we, we, we got to go home. And so we moved home to our community where the people love us and care for us. I don't have any great aspirations. I don't want a new job. I don't want to go somewhere and head up some big Christian organization. See, I'm home. I love my neighborhood. I love Lawndale. John used to always laugh at me and tell everybody, you know, Gordy's a nice guy if you live in Lawndale. He'll love you if you live in Lawndale. If you live anywhere else, he might not. Now, I hope I can be more loving to everybody. But you see, what we must do then is we must be grounded in the Word and we must grow deeper in CCDA. I'm so glad. Write books, please. Write books. I see Randy White out there that wrote a book, and I was so, it's so thrilling to see that. You know, Chris Rice just wrote the book, and this is a powerful book. I haven't read all of it. I've read lots of it, but about he and Spencer Perkins' story, and it's called Now Grace Matters. And I was having a conversation with Chris the other, you know, just yesterday, and, and Chris said, I said, Chris, I read some parts in here, man, and you were really telling a lot. I mean, it's kind of like a tell-all book. He said to me, he looked me dead face. He said, Coach, for grace to matter, we've really got to understand that we're sinners. We've got to understand what we've done wrong in order for there to be grace. And so he tells that. I'm so glad. Mark Gornick wrote a new book called Live in Peace, The Biblical Faith and the Changing of the Inner City that has some theological content. This has some theological content. We don't just need the stories. Real Hope in Chicago, of course, I hope you buy it and read it, and it's got lots of great stories, but I think I better get off of my duff and write some theology also. And we've got to get deeper into these things. And Viv has written a great book about the Christ uh, in the urban slums. We've got to read the Buy these books, read them, of course, and, and write more. Some of you go out there, some of you that are scholars, write some books about this that help us to get deeper grounded in the Word of God. Get involved in the theology track if you have an interest in it. Get involved in, in Viv's track on, on the theology of ministry. You see, CCDA is a philosophy of ministry that is grounded in the Word of God. And if we're going to be grounded in the Word of God, we get our marching orders from God. Even something as simple as when Jesus sent his disciples out, he didn't send them alone. How did he send them? Two by two. That's accountability. Hope House Ministry of Lawndale, we never let a Hope House man be by himself. Straight out of the word of God. You go with a partner. Then you are much less likely to get, do something stupid. Yeah, we all do, don't we? When you have somebody by your side. Lord Jesus, help us in CCDA to be people 
who are grounded, not just talking about it, that are grounded in the word of God. Help us to be people who put our faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not just have a half gospel of just going out and loving you every day and having a great quiet time, but help us to be people who love you and then love our neighbor and love other people. Help us to be righteous and help us to do justice and to love mercy. We thank you in your name.